Okay, this is most certainly one of the best lab posts that I've ever tested and there are quite a few reasons for that, but the new Ryzen AI9 inside of this plays a big part in that and we have to talk about it. This is Hubwood. So the laptop I'm reviewing today is the brand new Asus VivoBook S14, an upper middle class 14 inch thin and light laptop for around 1,475 euros or starting at around $1,300 probably. And let's just quickly go through the specs of this unit, but be aware that there are quite a lot of configurations available for the VivoBook S14 series right now. Its heart and soul is the new Ryzen AI 9 HX370, a very powerful 12 core 24 thread CPU that in this case can draw up to 55 watt. That also includes the integrated RDNA 3.5 graphics, the 890M, with 16 CUs as in compute units, 24 GB of soldered and unfortunately not upgradable LPDDR5X 7500 mega transfer RAM, a 1TB PCIe 4 M.2 SSD with reading speeds up to around 4 GB per second and writing speeds of around 2.6 GB per second. A 14 inch 16x10 1200p 60Hz OLED display with HDR, but there are other options for that as well. A 75 watt hour battery, Wi Fi 6E, a pretty small 90 watt USB C charger, and of course Windows 11. Okay, so upfront, Asus did not send this review unit, and I'm not getting paid for the review either. Just in case someone is doubting that due to my excitement for this laptop. But now, why is it so great? And I mean, I actually love it. And you know what? We are going to do that whole review a bit differently today. I'm actually going to start with its flaws because that's going to be a really short segment. And then I'm going to tell you about why it's so darn good. So the VivoBook S14 can get pretty warm above the keyboard right here under heavier load while gaming when using the highest performance mode. And then it also does get very hot right around this point over here. So at its underside as well, like really hot. So using it on your lap while wearing shorts or underwear, probably not a good idea. But the biggest downsides are probably the soldered, not upgradable RAM and the soldered and also not upgradable SSD. So it kind of completely fails in terms of upgradability. I know it's faster that way considering the RAM and 24 GB is probably okay for most people right now, but it's certainly a flaw, especially when configuring the laptop with like 32 GB which then probably costs around 100 bucks extra. But now let's talk about the good stuff. And trust me, there have been at least three occasions when I sat there and was like, wow, holy shit, while testing this laptop. Thanks to the absolutely amazing efficiency of the Ryzen AI9 HX370, and I really hate this CPU's name, this laptop and its 75 watt hour battery deliver up to 25 hours of idle battery runtime when the display is set to 20% brightness. Yes, you heard me. 25 hours. The CPU is so efficient that the whole laptop can drop to a 3 watt usage in total on idle, despite having 12 cores. And Wi Fi was activated as well, and the display. Watching YouTube at 50% display brightness with 20% loudness using headphones resulted in a whopping 11.5 hours. So, surely, like office tasks, etc., would grant you around 17 hours, which is what Hex Asus actually stated in their marketing material. That would make it the perfect laptop for students. I mean, if they can afford it in the first place, of course. And now listen, even gaming for hours is possible on this laptop. Using the laptop's quiet mode throttles the CPU to a TDP of around 16 to 17 watt and gives you 2.5 to 3 hours of runtime when gaming, even for AAA games. And I tinkered around a bit with that, for older and lighter games or emulation, it would even be possible to set the APU to 10 watt with additional software like the x86 tuning utility. And in that case, I also use Process Lasso to limit the amount of cores and threads a game can use because otherwise the 10 watt would have to be divided between 12 cores and 24 threads, which causes stuttering. But with that core allocation, the APU is even fast enough at 10 watt for lighter gaming and the laptop then can last four to five hours unplugged for gaming. I mean, that is sick. Now, but it's not only insanely efficient. It can also be brutally powerful if needed. On its maximum performance mode in Cinebench R23, it can get up to 21,500 in total and 2025 for the single core score. And that is kind of insane for only 55 watt. 
In Geekbench, it scored up to 2,896 for the single core and up to 15,200 points for the multi-core score. I also ran PC Mark 10, which is a good benchmark to test the overall system for its performance, like it's measuring an average of everything a PC can do combined. And here it scored a very high 7,800 points, which is a lot considering it does not have a dedicated GPU. That also means it is really blazing fast in everyday tasks and work-related stuff. Also booting and waking up from sleep was super fast. The Firestrike score was also super high with 9,084 points and 4,098 points for the Time Spy, as well as 3,265 for Steel Nomad Lite. Also, the included Radeon 890M is the world's fastest iGPU right now, while admittedly not that much faster as its predecessor, the Radeon 780M. Now, but it's not all about performance all of the time, is it? Because besides its power, it is a pretty well-built, thin and light laptop that only weighs 1.3 kg, while it's 16 mm thick. The chassis is made out of aluminum, and the hinges actually feel nice while you can easily open the laptop with one hand. Supported by this small bay at the front for your fingers to get a grip. The range of connections is okay for a thin and light laptop. Two USB-C ports, whereas one of them is needed for charging the laptop and one of them actually is USB 4. So you could even use an eGPU with this laptop. And if you're looking for a cheap one, check out this review later. Further, we get an HDMI 2.1 port a micro SD card reader, as well as a 3.5 mm audio jack. And also two more USB 3.1 type A ports on the other side, though no LAN port as in many thin and light laptops. And thanks to the USB-C charging, you could even use a power bank to further improve battery run times of the VivoBook S14. And in case of my 55 watt hour, 65 watt power bank by Briseus, that will get me a combined idle runtime of around 43 hours or 20 hours watching YouTube. Now the keyboard, despite having no numpad at this size obviously, was feeling great and I really enjoyed typing with it, even though I'm personally not the biggest fan of these super flat chiclet keyboards, but they nailed the key travel and feel here. And it even has RGB lighting, quite unusual for a non-gaming laptop. Also, the quite big touchpad worked perfectly fine, though I didn't use the gestures um, that are displayed on the sticker right here. Also, the 14-inch OLED display in this VivoBook S14 is really great. In this case, it has a relatively low resolution of 1920 by 1200p, which in my opinion is absolutely enough for 14-inch, but there are versions with a different screen as well, so keep that in mind. This one is a 60 Hz display with a nice maximum brightness of 400 nits and a great color accuracy, including HDR functionality. And HDR material looks really stunning that way. Also, it is perfectly fine for professional usage when you are a creator of any kind, while the VivoBook S14 itself is also, of course, more than powerful enough for any creative software out there like Premiere Pro, Photoshop, Blender, etc., you name it. And even the speakers are a blast and probably one of the best speakers in this price category that I have heard so far on laptops, especially considering its size. It actually does have good bass and it can get quite loud. Sounds like a decent Bluetooth box actually. And even the webcam is actually okay with being a 1080p model. And this is what the integrated camera looks like and what the integrated microphone sounds like. And this is what it sounds like when typing on the keyboard while recording. By the way, the webcam also allows Windows Hello login, so you can use face recognition for logging into Windows if you would like that. And here are the CPUs slash APUs TDPs for each of the four available performance modes that can easily be switched via pressing FN plus F, as well as the amount of what they pulled from the wall when playing Cyberpunk 2077. On the full speed mode, temperatures go up to 87 degrees Celsius at a room temperature of 23 degrees Celsius, causing thermal throttling. But the performance mode with its 45 watt already manages around 75 degrees. By the way, the fan noise is really good, especially when using the quiet or balanced mode. On the full speed mode, it can ramp up quickly to pretty loud levels, but that mode won't be necessary for anybody really. And even gaming is absolutely fine on the balanced or performance mode only.
the My Asus software lets you tinker around a bit in terms of the battery, the screen and such. You can for example activate a battery save mode or choose the performance modes here. Also the driver or BIOS updates can be handled in the My Asus software. Now for gaming I actually published a very extended dedicated video where I've tested 31 games on this very laptop so make sure to check that one out afterwards if you haven't already done that. But for now we're going to take a quick look at 5 assorted games from said video. But please note these benchmarks have been made at 1080p so you'd have to subtract a few percent here and there but it should give you a good overall idea of what to expect. For Hogwarts Legacy I was just taking a long walk from the school's dinner hall to Hogsmeade and the forest behind it just to complete the trip with a short flight on the broomstick. At 1080p medium settings with FSR set to performance, that resulted in an average of 58 FPS with 1% lows of 34. Keep in mind that this game's 1% lows get much better once you have actually entered a region or area when it had the chance to preload everything properly, so take that result with a grain of salt. Should be better in the long run considering the 1% lows. Also, AMD's fluid motion frames could be a good option in this case. And finally, adding the finals to my benchmark parkour. Your requests have been heard. Ran great actually. 91 FPS on average at 1080p with low settings using high textures and FSR set to performance once more. The 1% lows have been okay with 57 FPS on average. The frame time graph was pretty stable over the whole match with almost no micro stuttering. Playable just fine, really. So, next game. For Cyberpunk 2077, I was also testing AMD fluid motion frame, frame generation. And for this to see, the AMD overlay needs to be activated as MSI Afterburner can't catch it. So this basically doubles the FPS, leaving me with a whopping 84 FPS on average with 1% lows of probably around 66 FPS at 1080p with medium settings and FSR on quality this time. Now I know these aren't like real FPS but it felt fluid and while looking pretty darn amazing for an APU. I wasn't able to spot any major fragments caused by the generated frames. I mean this just used to be one of the hardest games to run only like 3 years ago and now performs really good on an integrated GPU at medium settings. Crazy. Even though frame generation was the reason for this outcome of course. Valorant is very CPU based and the beast of a processor, the Ryzen AI9, was able to show its muscles here. 363 FPS on average using the lowest preset with 1% lows of 184 FPS. By far today's best result. Not much to say other than I suck at this game as I don't play it. Sorry, well, yeah. Um, I mean even a 200Hz WQHD monitor could make sense in this case, which is crazy once more. However, I was not able to blame the laptop for my bad performance. <laughs> well. Thanks to 8GB of VRAM and frame generation activated, The Last of Us Part 1 ran much better than I actually expected. I was using the medium settings with FSR on performance and it once more showed that with these techniques, it's insane what is possible with an iGPU these days. 90 FPS on average with 1% lows of 68 FPS. Great frame times, really perfectly playable while looking great at the same time, I kid you not. Okay, so overall, is this a perfect laptop? No, because the fact that you can't upgrade it like at all. If you want to be safe in the long run, you should really go for a 32 gigabyte version with a two terabyte SSD if possible. But it's amazing for what it is though. A great combination of hardware, an insane amount of performance, almost unprecedented battery run times in a Windows laptop, a great display, great speakers, good build quality, good peripherals, a great overall package, just a small and pretty amazing all-rounder. And that's all for today. Hit that like button, follow the channel for more laptop reviews and mobile GPU stuff. Thanks for watching, see you next time, bye bye and tschüss.